Thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Rehm, Harvard MBA and former hedge fund manager Salman Khan has become an internet sensation. He's the founder of Khan Academy, a nonprofit organization that provides free online tutorials on subjects including math, science, and history. Today, his videos attract more than 5 million users a month, and they're used in classrooms around the world. In a new book, Khan encourages us to rethink our current education system and offers ways to improve it. It's titled The One World Schoolhouse, Education Reimagined. Salman Khan joins me in the studio. I invite you to be part of the program. Call us on 800-433-8850. Send us your email to drshow at wamu.org. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Good morning to you. It's good to have you here. Honored to be here. You know, I saw a piece you did with 60 Minutes. I was so impressed. Tell us how all this began. It was, uh, as was introduced, uh, you know, in, in 2004, I was an analyst at a hedge fund, not a, not a manager. Otherwise, I'd be dressed a little bit better. <laughs> I think you look just <laughs> oh, fine. Uh, the, 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 uh, and, and I had just gotten married, and I was in Boston, and some family was visiting me from New Orleans after the wedding, and uh, in particular, my cousin Nadia, who was 12 years old, and a uh, very bright young girl, and, and I was showing her the universities and saying, hey, yeah, I think you should ma- go to MIT, major in computer science, and then eventually turn that into a career at maybe the hedge fund. And, I, uh, and, and her mom actually told me that, uh, uh, you know, it's nice that you, you were mentoring Navia and you're, you're trying to make her go in your footsteps and all of these great things, but uh, she's actually having trouble with mathematics. And I, I had trouble believing that. I talked to Nadia about it. I said, you know, what, what, what's going what's on? What's going on? And uh, she said, I, I took a placement exam, and I just don't get unit conversion, ounces to gallons, meters, kilometers, that type of thing. And so I, I told her, I said, you know, I, I can see how that can be confusing, uh, but we've had conversations in the last two days that are, are deeper than that, and I think you can overcome that. And I think she thought that this was just a pep talk and, you know, she, that her cousin didn't really understand that she really didn't get math. And and so I, I said, well, how about when you go back to New Orleans, every day after work for me, school for you, uh, we get on the phone. It's extra work for you, but if you're up for it, I'm up for it, and, and, and I'm convinced you can do this. And she agreed, and so we started working together. And, uh, you know, long story short, first month was hard, but once she got into it, uh, she got up to speed, started getting ahead of the curve. Same girl who in sixth grade thought she couldn't get units ended up taking calculus her sophomore year in, in high school. Um, and, and so then I, I started teaching, uh, working with her younger brothers. And you fast forward about uh, two years, a word got around in the family that free tutoring was happening. <laughs> and uh, I had this cohort of students. And I started writing software for them. That was my background. And uh, you know, give them problems and, and see what they knew and what they didn't know. And so that I could make my tutorials more productive. And uh, I was showing this to a friend, and I was kind of saying, "Well, oh, this is great." And by this point, I had moved out to Silicon Valley in, in Northern California, and uh, and I was saying, "But it's difficult now, now that I have ten or fifteen of these kids around the country, and I'm trying to coordinate with." And it was my friend who who said, "Well, you know, why don't you make some of your tutorials on YouTube?" I, and I thought it was a, a, a horrible idea. I, you know, I said, "You know, the YouTube's for for cats playing piano, not not serious <laughs> mathematics." Um, <laughs> But I, I, I gave it a shot, and, uh, you know, my, my cousins famously told me they liked me better on YouTube than in person. And I, uh, so I, I kept going. And, you know, before, it, it didn't take too long to realize that people who were not my cousins were, were, were watching. But at what point did you decide you could actually quit your work, quit your job, and devote yourself to this kind of creation of tutorials? Yeah, so the first video was in 2006. Right. Uh, it wasn't until 2009 that the traffic was getting so large, and I was getting so much, so many letters, and I was having trouble, cr- frankly, keeping up with all of this as a hobby. And I was having, you know, I was even sneaking a few moments in in my day job to, to to tackle some of this. That you know, I sat down with my wife, and we set, I set it up as a not for profit. You know, saying, hey, the mission should be to reach as many people, empower as many people here. 
and uh, and I've, I'd never started a not-for-profit before, but I said someone should realize there's a high social return on investment here, an almost infinite social return on investment here. Uh, and so I, I quit my job, you know, and, and my wife and I, we kind of agreed, okay, we have about a year's of savings, uh, what, you know, and, and that'll be what, it, what, it, what I'll give it a shot. And, uh, you know, nine months into it, it started to get a little bit taxing. I started thinking about updating my resume a bit. Uh, and uh, but luckily, we, we were able to get get funding. Where? You know, the, the first funding came from her name is Ann Doerr. We got I got a ten thousand dollar donation online. Actually, she she emailed it. Uh, she mailed that one. And um, before I was getting these five ten dollar donations from people all over the world, which was which was tremendous and it was helping. Uh, but I told Ann, you know, if we were a physical school, you would now have a, a building named after you. Uh, and, and, and then she, when she found out that I was living off of savings, she really stepped up and, and gave a, a, a larger donation so that I could support myself with a salary. And then a few months later, I actually got a text message from Ann. She was at a conference uh, where Bill Gates was speaking, and she texted me saying, you know, Bill Gates is on stage right now say, telling everyone in the audience that uh, he uses the Khan Academy for his kids, he uses it himself. And... Um, that was a, a exciting a and surreal moment. moment <laughs> yeah. I must say. And then Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation came through with a large contribution, and then others followed. Yeah, they've been our largest funder. Uh, Google also at that time kind of stepped out of the woodwork and, and gave a significant donation. And there have been several other folks, uh, uh, a, a lot of them in, in kind of the tech world, who have come out to support this. How has the whole vision changed since you first began? You know, it's it's a uh, it's been a very organic process. Uh, you know, literally just starting with tutorials for cousins. Uh, but as we've grown, and even when we got that first funding, it was I, I always imagined Khan Academy being the supplementary thing. Like most people, you know, I, I you, you read news stories and you become cynical about the system, so to speak. And I never thought that we would be part of it. Uh, but right from the get-go, a public school district reached out to us in, in California and said, well, you know, we're fascinated by some of the work y'all are doing. Uh, how would you see this being used in a, in a fifth-grade math classroom? And uh, we said, well, you know, this would, we, this, these tools, these, the software, the videos allow every student to work at their own pace. It allows the information delivery component of learning to happen whenever a student wants it. And in our mind, it frees up the classroom to do more interactive things. So in the ideal world, kids would work at their own pace. Teachers would get real-time information about where they all are. And then they could use that information to do focus interventions, to lead projects, to have the students uh, tutor each other. And uh, within two weeks, they were... They said, this is a good idea. Let's let's try it with four classrooms. And since then, they've extended it to every classroom in the district, uh, fifth through eighth grade. And beyond that, it's been 20,000 classrooms around the country. And is that in any and all subjects or just in math? The, the, the site we have, especially the videos, are fairly broad. They Especially in math and science, they go all the way to college level biology and chemistry, this pilot that we started with Los Altos, and this is where a lot of our interactivity is right now, was in was in mathematics. But now? Now we're starting to look beyond that. You know, we've recently launched computer science on the site, which is shows kind of the creative side of computer science. Kids create portfolios of their work, and Los Altos is interested now in using that as part of computer science. And this is for elementary school kids to start to learn uh, to program. And, and our long-term goal is, as we had more content on the site, both videos and interactive content, uh, we, we think that elements of this can be introduced into almost any subject. Now, do you have family in addition to your wife? Do you have small children? Yes, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. Oh, my. <laughs> so is your wife staying at home with these children, or is she out of the house and working there as well? My, my wife's a, a physician, and she's working three days a week. And then we also have uh, our, my mother-in-law who lives with us. Uh, so, yeah, we have kind of a hybrid solution going on. And the, how do you make your income? I now get a salary from, from the Khan Academy. That's really fantastic in terms of trying to help other people. You've done this clearly as a nonprofit. Are you still offering these videos free of charge? Yeah, you know, when in, in 2007, when I was first fill out, filling out those, that paperwork for the IRS, they, they say a mission statement for your not-for-profit. 
And I said, well, uh, let me think of something. I thought about it for about four minutes. And I said, well, uh, a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And so to a certain degree, that the free part's part of our mission. And, and so, yes, we, we intend to always have it be free. And, you know, which raises the question of how you're going to support yourself. How, where, where is this? And, and, you know, obviously right now we're foundation and, and philanthropically supported. But hopefully we can figure out ways, um, you know, we look, you know, we, we've already started licensing our content to for-profit companies who want to use it for other purposes. And so we think there are ways that we can keep the mission sacred and, and keep it free so that learning really is, you know, it's an, it's an equal playing field. And really what you're talking about, the model you've mentioned, is sort of flipping the classroom so that kids can study at home, do their homework in the classroom, I mean, how does that work? Well, and, and to be clear, none of the ideas that I talk about at kind of the meta level or even in the book are, are new ideas. And to a large degree, they, they came to us from teachers or from parents or from students. And in these early days, you know, 2007, 2008, I started getting letters from teachers. And they started talking about this idea of flipping the classroom. They're like, you know, you've given a lecture on meiosis. You've given a lecture on photosynthesis or on factoring a polynomial. I don't have to use this valuable class time doing that anymore and doing it at the set pace. Some of the kids are lost. Some of them are bored. Instead, they can watch your stuff at, at their own time, at their own pace, or, and other resources that are out there. And, and they go into class time, and they can do true problem solving, true interactivity. So I'm Cotton, founder of the Cotton Academy, his new book, The One World Schoolhouse. Short break. Right back. And here's our first email for Salman Khan, author of the new book titled The One World Schoolhouse Education Reimagined. Here's an email from Carol who says, I'm working with a computer-savvy inmate and open-minded staff members in a Missouri maximum security prison. We put the con system on disk since the internet is not allowed and it's now being used in GED classes and being shown throughout the prison on closed circuit TV. Is Mr. Khan aware of this happening in other prisons? Does he have any suggestions? No, that, that's incredible. It's, Isn't it's, that fabulous? It's, it's great to hear. And, I mean, this is how we're discovering things, that as soon as you allow other ways for the knowledge to, to kind of get out there and people to interact with it, you're, we discover things like this. We have other, we have heard of other people talk about this idea of being able to uh, reach the, the, the prison population. Uh, but this is great to hear that. You know, the unfortunate thing is, is that there, there is limited or no access to the Internet. I mean, my suggestion would be to figure out a way to give at least limited access to the Internet so that the, the, they could benefit from the, the true interactivity of the site and they can get kind of the updated information. And a restriction to the Internet within prisons is for good reason. So what they've done here is to put it on disk and make it happen that way. I think that's incredible that's that great to you're hear. reaching in that way. 
Here's an email from Justin who says, I've come to rely heavily on Khan Academy for supplementing the public school education of my two young children. It's the best resource I have found for that purpose. No, I mean, it's letters, when we hear stuff like that, that's what, you know, in, in 2008, when there was some temptation to turn this into a for-profit company, um, it's letters like that that made us uh, made me realize at the time that, you know, we, we can't ever put any barrier to this information or to this to this knowledge and and and, and ha- never be captive to some other other motive because yeah as many justins and, and carols out there the, the better but haven't some people come along to you and said sal con you're nuts <laughs> oh why don't all the you? time <laughs> yeah i'm sure they do and before the Khan academy too <laughs> yeah but i mean that you haven't turned this into a for-profit education system and made billions. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, I, I think there's a, and sometimes it's well intentioned. I think there's sometimes, especially in Silicon Valley, people believe that true innovation happens in the for profit sector. That only for profits are lean and nimble and and efficient and all of that. And and, and I think that there's a meta level narrative that we're hoping to prove with Khan Academy. Uh, you know, one, we're not for profit, so that we can deliver this information to people. But there's also a part of me that wants to show people that a not for profit can scale and be lean and be nimble. You know, one thing that we were worried about maybe a year or year, you know, when we were starting off is, okay, we're not for profit. We have a very great board. They say yes, we should definitely pay people market salaries, et cetera. But we're not going to be able to give stock options because. There's no stock. No one owns Khan Academy. And we're like, will we be able to compete in Silicon Valley for the best talent, the best software engineering talent uh, without options? And, you know, the answer has been a resounding yes. In fact, we've been able to get some of the, the very best talent. Uh, Google's first employee, Craig Silverstein, is on our team. We have, uh, we, we have some, uh, you know, one of Facebook's, uh, one of their great engineers. She was also uh, the, rated the best engineer at Yahoo at one time. She's on our team. We have folks who are really the leaders in their respective fields all wanting to join our team. And, you know, there's a research study that came out a couple of years ago that said people actually aren't driven by money. And, in fact, the, the way that they get the most productive is they should have enough that they, they're not worried about money. They can pay their mortgage and they can send their kids to college. But they need intellectually challenging work and they need a mission. And, uh, you know... It, it's funny when I first read that this, that as sitting when when I was a hedge fund analyst, I was a little skeptical of that. Really, they they don't want huge bonuses, but you know now one that's true for myself. I'm very happy doing what I'm doing, uh, but it seems like it's true also for some of the, the the best talent out there. How many employees do you now have? We're now 36, and it's been a pretty rapid growth curve. Uh, this time last year we were 13, and this time two years ago we were one. So. How do the employees work? How does the share of work get divided? Are some pure technical, uh, on the technical side, and some on the educational side? How do you do it? Yeah, so, you know, on on one level, we are running a large-scale Internet piece of software. uh, And, you know, with 7 million users a month now, and they're, they're, you know, they've done close to three-quarters of a billion problems on our site. And so we have a pretty deep engineering team. Actually, two-thirds of our team are are software engineers and and designers. The other third of our team is some combination of content producers. Uh, There's myself, and I still produce content. We've brought some other people on. Uh, We have art history content that's made by some pretty incredible professors. Um, And we have a team that interfaces with schools, interfaces with teachers. We have some teachers on staff that are advising us, helping us uh, curate content. We have a kind of a research team that's looking at the data and figuring out how can we improve the content. And they're also looking at the literature out there and seeing what type of uh, 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 research can we leverage to make make our offering better. But each of your tutorials is just 10 minutes long. Why is brevity such an issue? Yeah, you know, it's one of these things uh, designed by hindsight. <laughs> it's a uh, when I started doing this, I think the first video I made for my cousins in 2006 might have been for 15, Nadia. For Nadia, and at this point there were several others. Uh, it was about 16 minutes. I tried to upload it to YouTube, and I got rejected because YouTube at the time for a regular account would only like, give you 10 minutes for each video. So, well, I guess I have to redo this thing. And so I read the, you know, I think it was like nine and a half minutes and I uploaded it. And I did all the videos in that. And you could cover a lot because you can do as many videos as you like. 
and uh and and one i got feedback from a lot of people that yeah this this is working for them they're allowed it allows them to pay attention but then i got researchers uh, coming out of the woodwork saying hey you know you must have read study x y and z and i cite a lot of them in the book that actually showed that there's no reason to give a lecture more than 10 15 minutes because people can't pay attention especially when it's deep content they can do it for 10 15 minutes then they need to kind of step out engage with the content do a little uh, practice or whatever else and then maybe step back in and they have their 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 attention is recharged and so um in si- in hindsight it actually is backed up by 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 how the brain works you know <clears throat> pardon me i've often said that uh, when i go to church 11-minute sermon, and my head is elsewhere after that. So I think you've hit it exactly right. You know, I think our listeners should know that you come from very humble roots. You were raised by your mother, who is from Bangladesh. You attended public schools growing up. How did your background shape you? Yeah, you know... uh... It's it's hard to say. I, I mean, I think I think uh, definitely, you know, one thing I cite is my older sister was a very strong student. She was three years older, and I think that, you know, when you enter a class and they already thought highly of your sister three years ago, even if you're a little mediocre, they kind of expect you to to step up a little bit. And I and I was definitely a beneficiary of that. I you know I, I went to public schools in Louisiana, and you know I, I think the schools I went to they were kind of the, I would call them probably the 50th percentile American school, just kind of the traditional school. And I had, uh, you know, teachers across the spectrum, but I had some incredible teachers, you know, early on. And I, I think, frankly, because my, my sister kind of blazed this trail, I was able to get into these GT programs where, um, and a lot of what I talk about in the book was motivated by, you know, I remember Miss Roussel, uh, the first time I, I entered the, I think it was fourth grade, and the rest of your curriculum is this Prussian model where all the students are being moved together and you're give, getting a lecture and you have these tests and these grades. And then all of a sudden, once a day, I would be going to this GT class and Miss Roussel would say, well, what do you want to work on? And, and I was like, she's asking me. I'm, yeah. I'm nine years old. Yeah. What do I want to work on? And, she, and, 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 and well, I, you know, I, say, I like to draw. And she's like, okay, well, we're going to draw then. And uh, she would, but she would push me. She would say, well, you know, here's pen and ink. Here's pastels. See what you can do here. What else do you like to do? I said, well, uh, I like puzzles. She's like, well, here's some puzzles. And she would push me and, and, and allow me to go at my own pace and, and give room for my creativity. And, and I, I can't un- understate how important I think that was. And I, and I think probably a lot of the ideas in the book in hindsight are, well, can we get that at scale? Can we get that type of interaction? Shouldn't all classroom activity be what I got to do with Mr. Sullivan? Actually, Ms. Krauss was the other GT teacher at that time. And, uh, and, and I think now that there's other ways to deliver the lecture and, and, and hopefully better ways. There's other ways to do a lot of the problem solving. Every student should have that experience where they go to class and they get, a, they get that, that personal attention. And they get personal attention not just with their teacher, but also with their peers. You know, right now, you go into a classroom K through 12, or in college, in K through 12, it might be 30 people in the room. In college, it might be 300. You're in the room together, often for the whole year. You don't know anybody. You don't get to talk. Maybe you know the two people who you sit next to. And it's actually very dehumanizing to be in a room and not know the people in the room. And what we say is, no, let's remove that lecture. There's no good reason to, especially a 300-person lecture, and use all of that for interactivity, use all of that for peer-to-peer learning, use all of that for interacting with the, with the professor. Are you as worried as some people are educators in this country about what has happened to our students. I, I you know, I, I won't say that I'm not worried. You know, you should, one should never be complacent about something as important as education. Uh, with that said, I think some of the concern is, is, is misguided. I mean, what people always cite is where we are on these test scores relative to other countries, and Estonia is beating us. Their algebra students can factor polynomials better than ours, and, and that's worth looking at. But I, I think uh, – and people say, hey, how can we be more like Singapore? How can we be more like Finland, be more like South Korea? And, and, and I take a completely different view on it. Uh, if you look at the U.S. holistically, you know, 50 years ago – and there still is innovation happening all the world. Uh, but the U.S. was a, a significant chunk of it, but it was happening in Europe and Japan and everywhere. 
you look now, the innovation has gotten even more concentrated in the U.S. You know, we, we were worried about Sony, and I mean, Sony's still a great company, but now Apple is owning consumer electronics. You have the Googles, the Facebooks, all of the innovative, the Twitters, they're all, they're all getting created in, 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 in this culture, in, in, in America. And, and it's because we have a culture of entrepreneurship, we have a culture of innovation, we have a culture of not caring what family you're from, but really what, what you can do, uh, a culture of, of, of taking risks and, and failure is acceptable, and uh, a culture of creativity. And so I actually think the, the task is not how do we get our school system to emulate the Prussian model as implemented in Singapore or Finland. It's how do we break the Prussian model and make it more American so that we can have creativity in the class time, so that all of these things that make America a great engine of innovation are actually happening in the classroom as well. Salman Khan, his new book is titled The One World Schoolhouse Education Reimagined, and you're listening to The Diane Rehm Show. But Salman, look at the dropout rate. Look at the number of young people who are so turned off by what's happening in the classroom that some have predicted that eventually the U.S. is going to have only a small portion of the population able to create these new systems to move the country forward. I mean, how do we close that education gap? And, and I think you hit the nail on the head. That is the main issue. The U.S. won't lose its dominance or its innovation, but who gets to participate in right. that in that question? And that's why, you know, and I keep hitting on it in, in, in the book, you know, we have this model where we keep pushing, we, we group students in this kind of factory. We group them in these age-based cohorts, and we push them along, and we have a set time and pace when they're supposed to learn certain things. So week three in algebra course, we're covering, we're covering quadratics. And, oh, you know, the information is delivered, some homework happens, and then there's an, a test. Some students get an A, some get a B, some get a C, some even fail the exam. And even though we've identified these gaps in the knowledge, I mean, some students fail the exam, because of the way the system is architected, we push them all forward, somehow expecting the student who got the C or the D or the F and the basic concept to now be able to comprehend the next one. And what you have, what essentially, when you ever, whenever you have everyone the delivery happening at a set pace, it's really just a filtering process. It's like, you know, imagine a, a factory line. You put The factory line's moving at a set pace. It doesn't matter if there are defects emerging. In a good factory, you'd go and fix the defects. In this factory line, you keep moving along, and at different points, you're like, hey, that's getting a little defective. Let's put it on a different line. That's not going to be a high-end product. That's going to be a low product. And then, so it's a whole filtering process, and at the end, you will end up with 5% of people who can really participate in this kind of the, the innovation economy. And what we're saying is, no, that... That makes no sense, especially in a world where we need so many more people who are creative, who are, who are uh, active problem solvers. We need, to, we need to do it the other way around. Instead of being variable what your grade is and being fixed when you learn it, we need to make variable when and how you learn it, spend as much time as you need to, but what's fixed is that you master the concept. It's much more important to have a mastery of algebra than to have a superficial understanding of algebra and then a superficial understanding of geometry and then a very superficial understanding of trigonometry and barely getting through calculus. It's much, once you really understand algebra, the rest of it will start to seem intuitive. So if you're at home looking at this tutorial, you say you've had to watch it two or three times and you still don't quite get it. Then what happens? And, and this is something that we're, we're constantly trying to address. And frankly, this is why we think there, there's always it, the, the human element will always be very important. So we're trying to address it virtually. Uh, hopefully there's multiple tutorials on that same topic. Uh, uh, we're exploring getting other people involved. My style might work for a lot of people, but maybe it doesn't gel with other people. We get other people there. There's a community of learners on the site, so actually people can ask questions. They say, I just don't huh. get this. What else should I look like? Look at? And people will either answer it in text or they'll uh, send a link to another maybe video on YouTube someplace or a Wikipedia article to help explain it. And then the real ideal, and you know, I have young children, I want them to have access to a physical school. And what this would do is set up the, the question, if the, if the student can't get it answered in any of these initial lines of attack, then they can go to school, and that's what the classroom is about. It's not about lecture. Uh -huh. It's about teacher, I have this question, or 
friend, I have this question. And obviously, then the friend can help them, but also the process of explaining the answer allows that friend to get it much deeper. Have you yet had an opportunity to talk with the current Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan? We have. You know, it's, it's, it's been a bit surreal for me. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, he tweeted that he uses Khan Academy, or someone tweeted that Arne Duncan uses Khan Academy with his own children. Uh, and then uh, more recently, he visited the office with several other officials from the Department of Education. And yeah, uh, uh, a great guy. And I think he really understands things uh, at a holistic level. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that we can uh, kind of tackle things along, alongside them. Salman Khan, he is the founder of the Khan Academy. He's now written a book about his concept and the ways in which he's putting it into being. The book is titled The One World Schoolhouse. Stay with us. National broadcast of the Diane Rehm Show is made possible in part by CSX, transporting two billion pounds of goods to market by train and working to help move the economy forward. CSX, How Tomorrow Moves, by Constant Contact, committed to helping small businesses and nonprofits stay connected to customers using email marketing. Learn more at ConstantContact.com. And by Novo Nordisk, for nearly 90 years committed to innovation and diabetes care. Learn more at NovoNordisk-US.com. This is NPR. On the next Diane Rehm Show, 50 years ago, the Roman Catholic Church sought to modernize by promoting activism, freedom of conscience, and a respect for all religions, the legacy of Vatican II. Character actor Stephen Tobolowsky was Bill Murray's annoying high school friend in Groundhog Day. He's also had recurring roles in Heroes, Deadwood, Californication, and Glee. We'll talk with Tobolowsky about his new memoir on the next Fresh Air. And we're back with Salman Khan, founder of the Khan Academy. During the break, I was asking just how far you think you can take this concept. You start perhaps in elementary school. You think you can take it to law school, to medical school, what? Yeah, you know, we already have, especially on the video side, and we hope on the interactive side soon, we already have content, I would say, at the uh, the university level in, in uh, the sciences, in mathematics, in art history. Uh, and, and we are already starting to work at some graduate level topics. We have a, a gentleman, Rishi Desai, who is a medical doctor, starting to cover the first two years of medical school. Wow. On Khan Academy, we've been working with Stanford Medical School about thinking about how they can uh, release more content in this way. And, and uh, our general sense is, uh, we think almost anything can be covered like this, and, and not just a graduate level. We can even go to, to lifelong learning topics. Okay. Now, let me understand something. So Stanford University gets involved, and they have students paying tuition to go to medical school. If they then use Khan Academy, how do they make up for the loss of tuition or do they become the for-profit part of your nonprofit institution? 
Well, uh, you know, Stanford's also a, a not for profit. They, you know, not for profit. They charge a lot of tuition, but yeah, no, no one owns that. no no one owns Stanford University. It's not a company. Um, you, you know, I, I think they understand what what this is about. This isn't about virtual replacing physical. This is about virtual being used as a tool to make physical more powerful. So, so they've already recognized, you know, they, they've actually been videotaping a lot of their lectures for, for several years now, and a lot of the students prefer to watch that at their own time and pace. And so they're like, well, why are we even going through this exercise? Let's make really good lectures, make them interactive, put them in these nuggets so that they're easier to digest, uh, embed interactive exercises with them, and that when the students get together in the class with the professors, with the TAs, they can do something higher order. They can uh, look at a case study. They can have a conversation about cases. They can do a lab. They can do a project. So in, in their mind, it allows the physical experience to become more valuable, and in my mind as well. It, 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 they leverage the technology. They, they're not getting replaced by it. You uh, uh, mentioned continuing education. Here's an email from Dan who says, Thank you, Salman, for helping me with statistics. Your method of teaching a complicated subject is greatly appreciated to a returning student. I love your drawings with many colors, love your voice, it's sincere, and I love your motivating style. Then identifies himself as a returning student at 60. Oh, that's great to hear. Isn't that wonderful? All right, let's open the phones first to Wichita, Kansas, and to Cynthia. Good morning to you. Good morning, Diane, and you sound wonderful. Thank you. My question is, I'm 54 and I'm unemployed, but I still like to mess with my brain and keep it ticking. Um, I'm just one of those persons that was lucky she got uh, passed through high school. And so I was wondering if Mr. Kahn... Uh, is thinking about help, helping people like us that don't go to school or can't go to college because we can't afford it and we're in our late 50s. Is there a program that we can get on and kind of relearn? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, everything that we're talking about, and even in, in our organization, uh, we never talk about, you know, we're, we're careful about students. We, we say students of all ages. And, and a lot of people are surprised. Obviously, there's a lot of high school and college students using us, but there's a lot of people well into adulthood who, who are using us to understand academic topics uh, or understand things, you know, how, 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 what is the financial crisis or how does a bank work or what's a credit default swap and, and things like that. And so the simple answer, Cynthia, is yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the site, uh, y you would enjoy it as it is. And, and one thing that we are exploring is how, you know, if, if there are sites like Khan Academy that can do the learning part for free, how do people prove that they've learned it and then they can take that into the marketplace and, and, and show an employer, look, I, I, I'm just as sharp as, as the, the little, you know, the 22 year old who just graduated from a good university. And, and we are exploring that, some ways to, to, to give uh, what I would call some micro. Some kind of certificate. Yeah, and, and, and making it valuable. You know, yeah. there, there are some programs, there are, you know, some of these, uh, MIT and Harvard have launched this edX initiative where they, they are giving certificates. And actually, Cynthia, I would encourage you to look at, at them as well. Um, but and, and we want to look at that as well because learning uh, the education is several things. It's definitely learning. That's the biggest part. There's a community aspect to it, but then there's a credentialing aspect to it. And, and we definitely want we want to enable you to learn, but also prove to the marketplace that 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 you can contribute. How does she get to the Khan Academy? It's it's just KhanAcademy.org. Dot org, and then you move around. Yeah, you know, people can search for the content if they know what they're looking for. They can go by topic. Uh, they can start practicing the interactive exercises and that'll work them through. Uh, uh, start at 1 plus 1 and they'll just keep going as they go progress to trigonometry or calculus. Uh, there's computer science that students can work on. All right, to Rochester, New York. Good morning, Wilma. Good morning. Um, you covered a lot of what I was going to talk about, but I find this so exciting. You know, um, some parents, when they look at their newborn, they ask that question, are you the one? And um, I think your parents must be saying, absolutely, yes, you are the one. Well, you're making a, a brown man blush. So. <laughs> ah, that's wonderful. Thanks for your call, Wilma. Let's go to Louisville, Texas. Good morning, Brett. Good morning, Diane. This is a great show, and I really appreciate you doing it. Thank and, you. And, Con, i got to tell you, you've really helped my nephew tremendously. 
Um, I recommended his site to you when he was trying to get it. He's still trying to get his GED, but he's actually getting a lot of help he, he couldn't get before. So that's a huge thing. But I was curious if you are putting forth any effort to um, educate people as to our uh, the education system that we have now that has this over reliance on testing. Um, if you, if you put any effort into that, or if you're just focusing on um, on the Khan Academy. Yeah, it, it, uh, that's a great question, Brett. Uh, it's wonderful to hear about your nephew. Uh, you know, it's a I, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about testing, and I think testing will will always exist to to some degree. But I think over reliance is, is the right word. Testing tests only measure w- what they test, um, and and I think what's exciting about what what we're doing, or hopefully doing, or at least bringing up in in the conversation is, well, what are other ways of of measuring or evaluating subjective and and objective, and and you know one thing that I talk a, a great deal about either you know just on when i talk to people is is okay tests measure one thing can we measure perseverance in a traditional test you can't on something like khan academy you can because we 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 can see how the student is engaging with the site we can give that feedback to teachers Uh, we can cater the content for different types of learners in different ways Uh, can we measure people instead of these numeric tests also with a portfolio of creative works to a large degree when we hire people at khan academy yeah test scores are nice but and grades are nice and, and degrees are nice, but we say, what have you created? Show us your creations. Tell us how you thought about those creations. That is at least or far more important than tests. And then the other dimension that I think is, is completely lost right now is how how much do you contribute and how capable are you contributing to uh, the improving improving the learning of those around you? And and one thing I talk a lot about in the book and, and we try to foster on the site and we're seeing a lot in the classrooms that are using this is students helping each other and, and evaluating each other, saying, yeah, that, that was really great. They really helped me. And, and I hope in the kind of college transcript of the future, yes, there'll be a few test scores. Maybe you'll take these micro-credentials that, 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 I, that uh, we were talking about to show that you might, you, you've mastered algebra and you've retained that knowledge. But it would also have an evaluation, wow, you've really contributed to other people's mm-hmm. learning, and mm-hmm. you have this really great portfolio of creative works. Here's an email from R. John who says, how does the Khan Academy teach and grade good writing? That's a great question. And right now, we, we don't tackle writing. Um, on the video side, we tackle a few of the humanities, especially on art history, and we have a little bit on history. We hope to do a lot more. I- I'll tell you how we're envisioning tackling writing. Uh, and I'll start with how we're tackling computer science, which might seem strange. But our computer science, we're, we're tackling it as a creative uh, field, which it is, and and uh, compu- students can go there. They have they can create their programs, interact with it. They have a little canvas where they can see what they created, and then they can share it. And that's an important point. So when they share it on their portfolio, then other users can look at their work. They can comment on it. They can rate their work. They can take that and then make it their own. And we think the com- the same analogy could apply with writing. You go. There's projects on Khan Academy. Write your opinion about this or write a novel, write a short story. You put it out there. It goes into your portfolio. Instead of getting graded, oh, you got a B plus, and then that's kind of a value statement on your intelligence or something. Or who's somebody else's oh, exactly. interpretation exactly. of your intelligence. Exactly. Other people will comment on it, give it feedback, and you can continuously improve it so that it becomes part of your part of your portfolio. And in order to get feedback from other people, you will also give feedback. And by just critically looking at other people's work, that will also hopefully make you a better writer. And I think we can tackle some of the, the building blocks of writing, whether it's vocabulary and grammar, in a way that we're, we're tackling some of the building blocks of mathematics. To Easton, Maryland. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just wanted to bring in the homeschooling perspective because I homeschool my two children who are in fifth and third grade, respectively, and we absolutely love the Khan Academy as a resource for those 10 to 12 minute snippets, especially for math and science, and they really kind of hit the lesson home, and it's just a great resource um, for homeschoolers because it's, you know, when I don't have all of the same well, right now I'm fine with third and fifth grade, but it's nice to go to experts who know what they're talking about and can and, and can really help a lot. So I think it's just a, it's a great resource, and I really appreciate it. No, and that's, that's incredible to hear, Rebecca. And our, I, I, I think our whole team gets motivated when we hear stories like this. And, and I, and, you know, the homeschooling is interesting because when I started all this, I didn't even think about it, but it's completely obvious that this hopefully is a valuable tool for 
tool for homeschoolers. And I think what's really interesting about homeschoolers is they've kind of brought back a lot of, you know, the book's called One World Schoolhouse. It, there's a play on One Room Schoolhouse. And there, there, there were some really strong advantages there, this idea of a more personalized attention, a lot more interactivity, a lot more allowing the student to pick their direction and be a little take ownership of their own learning. And, and so uh, I, I think homeschoolers are kind of the, the leading edge of, 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 of this new way of, of thinking about learning. Good luck to you, Rebecca. Thanks for calling. Here's an email going straight to the title of your book. It's from Peter, who says, I'm curious if you have a strategy for expanding into emerging market countries which have limited internet penetration and access to computers. Yeah, it's, it's something that we have been thinking and we're starting to think a lot more about. Um, so, so there's a couple of things that we're doing, and then I'll talk about the, just the access issue. Uh, we have had a translation project. Uh, we've translated to varying degrees into 12 languages already. The ones that are furthest along are Spanish, Portuguese, Bengali, Arabic. If you go to the bottom of the page on Khan Academy, there's a little drop down. It's right, it says English. If you just pick another language, you'll see the videos translated into those languages. So huh. there's 7,000 videos. And I shouldn't say translated. They've actually been redone for, uh, to I a large see. degree in a lot of these I other see. languages. And, and so you can, not the whole site, but just the video component is there. But that raises the issue of, okay, if, even if we're creating this content, in a lot of these places, people don't have access to it. Uh, and, and there's, one, there's a lot of separate groups, uh, NGOs, who are taking our content, putting it on DVDs, putting it on thumb drives, creating offline versions of the website, um, and, and, and putting it out there. And, you know, we've heard stories, of, you know, there's an there's a orphanage in Mongolia where some volunteers from Cisco went out there and, and set it up. And there's a 15-year-old girl, Zai, out there who started using the, the resource, and now she's become our main translator into Mongolian. 15-year-old, I think she's 16 now, orphan wow. girl. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of the intermediate solution. But the good thing is now this, this, this kind of education tool can ride Moore's Law. That, you know, the, 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 already in India they're talking about sub-$100 tablet devices. Uh, Internet's getting cheaper and cheaper. And so even in the book I articulate essentially how – Right now or in the next year, we can, if, if we have a couple of students sharing a computer, because we don't think computer, kids should be on a computer all day, uh, even in the developing world, you could deliver this type of experience for a, a penny a day. And you're listening to The Diane Rehm Show. What happens to teachers in this process? Are you going to put them out of business? No, not at all. I, you know, I, I, it, it's, a, it's a really good point to bring up because whenever people talk about a virtual thing that's scaling, you know, Amazon.com, it's like, oh, that's going to that's gonna replace the physical thing that's, you know, they have to get buildings and, and hire people and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and that might be true for certain things like that, but absolutely not for, for education. I, I think what's happening, and we're seeing it with the teachers we're working with, and a lot of the adoption is happening through teachers, and they're seeing that it's, a, it's, it's not replacing them, it's empowering them. Instead of having to shepherd students at one pace and, 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 and have these variable understanding, they're, they're able to leverage class time for more interactivity. You know, I always imagine education is a spectrum of things. At one end is, you know, very rote learning, your multiplication tables and, and your vocabulary. And at the other spectrum is this kind of never-ending, open-ended, creative problem solving, whatever else it might be. And what Khan Academy, we're going to try to tackle as much of the different points of the spectrum we can, but it's an infinite spectrum. And so it frees the humans to tackle the stuff that computers will never be able to do, the mentorship, the inspiration, the really understanding what's going on in that particular student's life, that particular student's brain, the, the style of stuff that, that Miss Roussel had done with me when, when, I, when, I was a, when I was in fourth grade. And lots of folks have asked how to spell con, and it is K. H A N Khan Academy. Just like Genghis. Like Genghis. <laughs> no, I I, maybe I shouldn't have that association. <laughs> All right. And then last question about evaluating teachers. How do you think that should be done? Yeah, you know, this is probably, you know, it's it's obviously a, uh, a kind of a heated topic and, and frankly where I, I have the least experience and, and you know I think it has to be a holistic thing. I think it has to be a combination. I think, you know, tests will always be there. Test scores will always be there. Uh, and, and they'll be part of a portfolio of evaluating something. But I think it, it goes well beyond that. You, you know, you should people should be measuring how do other uh, – you know, I don't even want to uh, – 
I, I could think of a million different ways. I mean, one thing I point out in the book in some detail is be very skeptical of tests. They, they are sometimes necessary to give you a data point, but they only measure a one dimension. So a test definitely by itself should not be the, the only predictor of, or only value statement on a student or a teacher. So what's next on your agenda for the Khan Academy? Well, we're trying to make much richer content simulations. We're trying to broaden it, uh, start experimenting with things in the humanities, ways for students to answer more open-ended questions, their opinions on stuff, how they feel about a piece of artwork, That's how they good. feel about a piece of uh, uh, history. Uh, they're, they're, uh, and, and on top of that, uh, we're looking to open up the platform. We have in-house some people making uh, hopefully great content, but there's so many people out there, teachers around the world, who could also contribute in different ways. So we hope to open that in six months, and hopefully we just grow to a few hundred million people over the next few years. Salman Khan, and his new book is titled The One World Schoolhouse Education Reimagined. You can go to Khan academy.org learn all about the offerings and it is spelled K-H-A-N Congratulations Thanks for having me And thanks for being here Thanks for listening all I'm Diane Reen Music